Rob Kinney's parents divorced when he was about 13 or so. His dad was given custody because his mom had turned to alcohol, but his dad had this habit of leaving his children alone for the weekend while he went an hour away to spend the weekend with his girlfriend. And that lasted for about a year and then the kid's dad just uh, bailed on them completely. That made for a, and, and many other things, it led to a tumultuous childhood for, for this young boy and for his, children, and for his uh, siblings. Sadly, that's not a rare circumstance. Many children experience an absent father, a distant father, a hostile father, or something even worse. So when Rob got into his 50s, he started a YouTube channel called Dad, How Do I? And he's been at it now for a little over two years. He has over 4 million subscribers that tune in to him. Good Morning America called him the Internet's Dad. What he does is he, give, he gives practical advice on things like how to fix a toilet, how to boil rice. He, uh, he tells some dad jokes and he provides some emotional support for people who contact him, send him stories about damaged relationships that they have experienced or traumatic experiences. Why is something like this happening? Because Millions and millions of people are looking for a dad. They're looking for a father. And the other thing that makes this so important that I would even bring it up is because your earthly father greatly affects your view of your heavenly father, of God. 81% of Americans believe that God exists. One pastor commented that people used to ask if God existed. Well, that seems to be satisfied. People today, this pastor said, complain about the characteristics of God that they don't like or that they think that this is what God is like and they complain about it. Now, do people care about God? Do, do they really, really care? Well, actually, over two-thirds of Americans that were polled by George Barna said that it would be very desirable to have a close relationship with God, and many people cry out to God. Whether they believe in God or not, they, maybe they sort of believe that there might be a God out there, and so when they get into trouble, or there's a crisis, they may cry out to God, and then forget all about him, even if, if he does something that is gracious toward them. There was a businessman that was late for a very important meeting, and he couldn't find a parking place anywhere in the parking lot or in the block that he kept circling and circling, looking for a parking place. And so finally he got so desperate that he cried out in a prayer to God. He looked to heaven and he said, God, please, if you could give me a parking place, I promise I will go to, I will go to church every single Sunday for the rest of my life. And on top of that, I will even quit drinking. And about that time, a parking place opened up and he said, he looked at heaven again. He said, never mind, I found one. That's kind of the way it is with a lot of people. They cry out to God and then they forget about him, even if God has done something for them and provided something for them. Can we know, really know God? Does he care about us? What do you personally know about God? Well, we're in a series of sermons entitled Believe. And today's sermon is Believe in God the Father. If 81% of Americans believe that God exists and 99% of Christians believe that he exists, you would think it would be 100%, but it's 99%, then I don't really need to prove God's existence in this sermon today because most people believe that he already exists. The question that I have for you today is, do you know God? R.C. Sproul, the philosopher and theologian, was once asked, what, in your opinion, is the greatest spiritual need in the world today? And Dr. Sproul said, the greatest need in people's lives today is to discover the true identity of God. Most people do not understand the God that they are rejecting or the God that they are ignoring. He then was asked, 
What, in your opinion, is the greatest spiritual need in the lives of church people? And Sproul gave the very same answer to discover the true identity of God. So let's look at at least some of what the Bible says in this next 20 minutes, half an hour, what the Bible says about God. First, God is a gracious father. If you read the Bible objectively, that is what you notice more than anything else. In the New Testament, Jesus himself refers to God as Father over 150 times. Jesus said a lot about our God, actually, our Father, our Heavenly Father, in Matthew 6. In verse 4 and 6, he said that if we help others unselfishly, God will see that and he will reward us. In verse 8, he says that our Father knows what we need before we even ask him. He says in verse 26 and 27 that if God provides for the birds of the air, then surely he's going to provide for us because we are worth so much more than the birds of the air. In verse 30, he, we read that God clothes the lilies of the field, so if he clothes them, then how much more is he going to clothe us? And finally, he says in verse 32, your heavenly Father knows what you need, and if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these other things are going to be given to you as well. Psychologists say that the view of ourselves, the view that we have of ourselves, comes largely from our parents. So if our parents had a negative attitude toward us, if our mother, for example, said to us repeatedly, you're never going to amount to much of anything, then that's going to haunt us for the rest of her life. And, and we might try to prove that she's wrong, or we might just assume that she was right and never really amount to very much at all. If you had a father who was constantly saying that you're stupid and you're clumsy, then when you hear that God is our heavenly father, you might think that God thinks the same thing about you. If you had a troubled childhood due to some bad parenting, it is really good for you to, instead of be, being thinking about, this is what my parents said, or this is what my parents did that was wrong, it might be better for you to just focus on what characteristics could have made them good parents and use that to guide you forward as you become, if you become a parent, that would be the way that you would parent your children. Psalm 37, 4 says this about our Heavenly Father. Delight yourselves in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. 1 Timothy 6.17 tells us to put our hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? The God of scripture has a smile on his face when he looks at us, he sings over us, he cares for us. For us. Psalm 84 11, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good things does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. For every no that God says to us, and yes, he does say no to certain things, there are a thousand yeses for every no. Now, we know that parents are imperfect, they make mistakes, I've made mistakes. You, you all know, if you're a parent, that you've made mistakes. We have our own hang-ups, we have our own deficiencies in, in our character and in our practice. Maybe we believe one thing and we fail to carry it out. What really counts, though, is, yeah, you know your parents are going to be imperfect, they may be great parents, but they're still not perfect. The, the thing that really counts for us is to know that our Heavenly Father only speaks the truth. And so what He says about us, what He thinks of us, we know that's true because He only speaks the truth. And somebody might say something to you that's harsh, that they don't even really believe themselves. And God never does that. God only says those things that are true. And your Heavenly Father says, that you are worth a lot. Second, God is faithful. God keeps his promises. Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse nine. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God. 
keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. You can rely on God. Now, if you've ever raised children, you know that there comes a time when the child begins to rebel. Now, why do they rebel? Well, part of the reason why they rebel is because they are developing. They are experimenting with their own identity and what they hope to be and what they hope to accomplish. They're experimenting with autonomy. And they might decide that I'm going to follow the, the script, the path that my parents have laid out for me. And they might decide, no, I'm rejecting this. I'm going to do, do my own thing. So they are going to grow up and leave home someday. We hope. Okay, we hope. Rebellion comes sometimes just because they, we all rebel. And some rebel in totally the wrong direction. Sometimes rebellion comes because parents are too strict, too harsh, too unfair in their punishment. However, I, I think that one of the biggest reasons that children rebel is because of resentment over broken promises. Parents make promises and then they don't keep those promises and the child begins to resent their parents. You promised that you would fix my bicycle. You haven't fixed my bicycle. You promised to take me to see the Colts play, and we never went to see the Colts play. You promised to coach my team, and you never coached my team. You know, sometimes I, I, we, we forget, sometimes. Sometimes our circumstances change, and, and we're not able to do something, and the children sometimes don't understand that. And sometimes we procrastinate. We, we put things off. We're so busy, and we just put it off and put it off. I think about the time when our, our youngest son was in high school and he and I talked about taking a canoe trip down this river that had some really cool rapids. And I, I personally, I put that trip off multiple times for a year. And I realized, wow, he's going to be out of high school and gone before we get this trip in and then we're never going to be able to take the trip. So finally we went. And it's kind of funny, I asked him about this uh, some time back, and he doesn't remember me putting off that trip. All he remembers is that we did it, we went on the trip, we had a lot of fun, and we broke both paddles <laughs> on that trip. You know, sometimes parents break promises and, and they just, they don't think a thing of it. You know, they move on and, you know, that's just, that's life. And we crush our kids' spirit when we do that. And it makes them harder to believe that anybody is going to keep their promises. Even God. They just think that other people are always going to break their promises. A broken promise leads to resentment and resentment leads to rebellion. God isn't the kind of father who says he's going to do something and then not do it. Now, so much of what God does for us goes completely unnoticed. We just live our life and we assume so much that is good that happens to us. So, for example, did you wake up this morning? Yes, you did, because you're watching this. And did you thank God that you have another day? Did you thank God that you could have the health to get out of bed? Did you thank God that you could take nourishment? Did you thank God that you could communicate with other people? Did you thank God for the things that he does for us, the things that maybe we don't even attribute, attribute those things to him, but we ought to because so many good things, in fact, all good things come from him. And then third, God is perfect. Thumb through the Bible and you will see that truth everywhere. Now, there used to be a uh, commercial about Chevy trucks that Chevy trucks are like a rock. Like a rock. I mean, that was, that was the slogan. But the Bible says that God is the rock. His works are perfect. It also says a lot of other things that are perfect. His way is perfect. He makes our way perfect. He is perfect in knowledge. His law is perfect. He is perfect in beauty. He has a perfect plan. He provides perfect peace. His, he is perfect in faithfulness. His will is perfect. His power is perfect. Everything is perfect about God. Our God is perfect. Isn't that great? 
<laughs> some people are so down on themselves that they take that and they say, well, God is 100% perfect. I am not perfect. Therefore, I'm always disappointing God. I'm always letting God down. You know, there's this quotation I really like. God says, you're not letting me down because you're not holding me up. Have you ever had a parent or teacher or boss who could never be pleased? No matter what you did, it wasn't good enough, it wasn't quick enough. If you got C's on your report card, it should have been B's. If you got B's, it should have been A's. If you got A's, it should have been straight A's. No matter what you did, you could not please your mom or your dad. If you straightened up your room, then they would come in and point out the one thing that's not straightened up or straighten it up themselves. Just And it just made you feel like you could never do anything to please them. Some of you think that that's the way God is. That he's always disappointed, always discouraged about us. If that's really the way you think about God, then you're not going to want to spend much time with him. I mean, really, do you hang out with people that are always putting you down? No. I mean, at least you don't want to hang out with people like that. So why would you want to spend time in prayer and Bible study, spend time thinking and walking with God if you think he's always down on you? He isn't. The Bible says that heaven is a perfect place and only perfect people get to go there. Now, if imperfect people were allowed to go to heaven, it wouldn't be perfect anymore, would it? That means you don't stand a chance to be good enough, perfect enough to go to heaven. You can't do enough good deeds to earn your way into heaven. But God has a plan, and that plan makes you blameless, faultless in his sight. Now, God already knows all the simple things that you are going to do in life. So it's not like he's surprised if you do something wrong. But he's given you a choice. He is gracious and he is forgiving. But he's also just. And he will not let the guilty go unpunished. Now remember, God doesn't force anything on you. You can choose to believe or you can choose not to believe. Once you make that choice, you don't have the freedom to choose your consequences of that belief. If you say, I don't believe in God, the Father, you have the freedom to do that. He'll let you walk away. But if you choose to be separated from God now, you've also chosen to be separated from him for eternity. That's the consequence of that choice. And that is called hell. Somebody might say, well, I don't believe in hell. Okay, fine. That doesn't mean it isn't real. I could say, oh, I don't believe in Montana. I've never been there. I've never seen it. I don't think it exists. Well, it does exist. Whether I've seen it, whether I believe it exists or not, it's still there. Just because we say, I don't believe in something doesn't change anything. That's called denial. Just because something is unpleasant and we don't like the idea of it doesn't mean that it's not true. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. But all people who choose to reject God's salvation that he offers to us through Jesus Christ will find themselves on that broad road that leads to destruction. And God doesn't want that to happen to anyone. That's why the Bible says that he is not willing that any, any should perish. He doesn't choose, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you, but you're, you're headed for destruction. He doesn't do that. God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all would come to salvation. That's what the Bible teaches. Anyone who would put their trust and their faith in Jesus Christ, that's the way to salvation. We believe we repent or turn from our sins. We confess our faith. We are baptized. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're put on that road 
the narrow road, the narrow gate that leads to eternal life. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much that we can pray to you and know that you are our perfect Heavenly Father, a loving Heavenly Father, a gracious Heavenly Father, a Father who gives us great mercy, a Father who wants us to be in heaven, but at the same time does not make anyone go to heaven against their will. We thank you so much for the blessings that you give us each day. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.